Dry Land. Elephant Island had been named years earlier for the throngs of elephant seals that crowded its rocky shores. Seals and birds were its only residents. Only 20 miles long and 13 miles wide, it lies at the furthest tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. Beyond it stretches Drake's Passage. By navigating there through fog, snow, and winter seas, Worsley had found the needle in the haystack. True to its name, the island presented them with an elephant seal on landing. Almost immediately, the animal was converted into food. Green began cooking again, although without his usual smile. For the rest, first several hours on land, the men ate, slept, and ate again, standing around in small groups, stupefied and silent. From a penguin colony nearby, gentoos waddled down the beach to stare at their visitors. Shackleton and Worsley walked some distance along the beach, sizing up their location. It was a desolate spot. Thank God I haven't killed one of my men, the boss said. I knew that one more night of exposure would do for some of them. They walked in silence for a few moments, their feet crunching in the loose rocks, and then Shackleton added, What do you think of this place, Skipper? Any solid land is a godsend when we are so badly in need of rest and food, Worsley admitted. But I've looked around a bit and, well, it's not much like the Riviera. It was quite an understatement. Grim black cliffs reached up 800 feet into the fog at their backs, and the 2,500-foot peaks behind those were covered with glaciers and snow. Cormorants, squaws, and cape pigeons wheeled in and out of the mist. Patches of orange lichen made the only bright color, and a high water mark on the cliff wall showed that their landing site was not at all safe. Storm tides would frequently submerge their spit of land when the weather turned ugly. They would have to find a better beach before deciding what to do next. But before anything could be done, the men needed to rest. Through the remainder of the day and night, they slept and ate, keeping the fire going in the stove with the blubber from four four more seals they slaughtered on the beach. Shackleton let the crew sleep until 9.30 the next morning. Then he told them the news. They would soon have have get back in the boats and move. At 11, Frank Wilde and five men pushed the wheels out into the crashing surf and rowed off in search of a new landing site. A couple of miles offshore, a belt of pack ice and eroded bergs was drifting past, warning everyone of the winter to come. Meanwhile, the men continued to eat and rest, enjoying the feel of solid ground under their feet, stretching their cramped limbs, melting glacier ice into drinking water. They moved the stores and tents as high up the spit as possible and waited for Wild's party to return. Darkness had fallen by the time the wills ground uh, onto the shingle beach again tired and hungry wild devoured a seal steak as he described their nine hours of searching the coastline the only suitable place they had found was seven miles to the west it was another narrow spit of land with a penguin rookery and a glacier nosing down the mountainside nearby the boss decided they should set out at dawn at five o'clock the next morning with the stores loaded onto the boats the men pushed off into the water again rowing along the base of the cliffs within two hours the winds picked up quickly blowing into hurricane force, crashing waves against the rocks and hurling spray over the men in the boats, where it froze into slush. They struggled forward against a hard current, sometimes seeming to stand still despite their straining at the oars. The boats rolled and pitched in the violent, sucking backwash from the cliffs. Somehow, Green Street had lost its, his mittens and the blisters on his hands froze like pebbles under the skin. Macklin, too, lost a mitten, and his hand turned white with frostbite on his oar. For hours, they battled their way westward in a blizzard. By three o'clock, the beach was in sight. And with a last effort, they dragged themselves through the breakers and hauled the boats out of reach of the waves. Some of the men immediately killed a seal that was resting on the rocks, and Green Street staggered toward it and thrust his frozen hands into the bloody, steaming carcass. The beaten men stumbled on numb feet to examine their new campsite. It was only a faint improvement over the first one, bare and exposed to the wind. Sharp, sudden gusts carried away some of their stores the moment they were set down and ripped one of the threadbare tents to shreds. The beach rose steep above the high tide mark. At least they would not be swept away in a storm. It was impossible to set up the tents with the wind shrieking around them. The men slept exposed on the ground with snow drifting up against their backs. The blizzard continued for two days, and no one dared crawl from the protection of his sleeping bag or blanket. On April 17th, after two days at the new site, 
Shackleton ordered the men out to kill penguins. They skinned the birds with frozen hands, choking on wind-driven snow with each breath. Shackleton knew, everyone knew, that they could not hold out on that desolate spot all winter. The seals and penguins might not last, and even if they had made it to summer, whaling ships rarely came anywhere near Elephant Island. No one knew to look for them there. Someone would have to go for help. The closest inhabited land was Cape Horn at the tip of South America, 600 miles away. But sailing due north across Drake's Passage in the winter would be suicide. All the winds and waves would be against it. The only possible course was to take advantage of the prevailing winds and currents and make for South Georgia Island, 800 miles to the east. Worsley and Shackleton had known for months that it was their only hope. Skipper, we shall have to make that boat journey, however risky it is, the boss said. I'm not going to let the men starve. Worsley's voice was almost swallowed by the wind. Would you let me take the boat, he asked, believing the leader should stay with the men. No, Shackleton replied sharply. That's my job. He paused, glancing back at his crew. It's hateful to have to tell the men that we've got to leave them. It's their only chance, Worsley said. Shackleton looked very grim. If things went wrong, it might be said that I had abandoned them. His responsibility had never been greater. Shackleton consulted with Wilde, who demanded a place on the boat beside his leader. But Shackleton was relying on his second-in-command to hold the men together while they waited for rescue. Then he gathered the men to break the news. He would take the James Caird and go for help. Immediately, <coughs> every man stepped forward to volunteer. Choosing a crew was difficult. Worsley must go along. No, no one else was capable of the navigating that this journey would require, and his experience with small boats was unmatched. Crean, the seasoned explorer, was fit to go. Shackleton also chose Tim McCarthy, one of the seamen, who had remained cheerful and steadfast through all their troubles, and who was young and strong. In spite of Shackleton's enduring resentment of McNeish ever since his mutiny, he resolved that the carpenter must go in order to make running repairs to the boat. Last, Shackleton chose John Vincent, another of the seamen who was young and strong, and also something of a troublemaker. Shackleton chose Vincent to keep him away from the other men. They would leave in four days. Meanwhile, there was much to get ready. McNeish began refitting the 22-foot-long carrot for the journey, decking it over the packing crate lids and canvas, and raising the sides. The keel was reinforced with the docker's mast. Canvas bags were stitched together from sails and filled with 1,000 pounds of rocks for ballast, and two kegs were filled with glacier melt for drinking water. The boat stores would include one of the Primus camp stoves, six weeks worth, for six men, of sledging rations for hoosh, and some uh, bouillon cubes, sugar, powdered milk, and biscuits. Worsley's navigational equipment was down to one compass, his sextant, and his tables. And of the 24 chronometers he had taken with him from London, uh, he had only one remaining. The job ahead of him was formidable. On the night before departure, the men were anxious and restless. Wilde and Greenstreet joked with Worsley, telling him to be sure to bring back plenty of beer. Shackleton shared his last two cigarettes with Wilde as they discussed backup plans. The boss wrote and signed a letter with his instructions. If he did not return with the relief ship, Wilde was to take the men in the remaining two boats and try to save themselves. The six-man relief team was ready to set out the next morning.